and then mm -hmm. we can uh we can then uh, kick off just the one minute ice okay it's um it's 11 o'clock so uh good good morning uh ladies and gentlemen welcome to the american chamber of commerce and welcome for our second online session with um Serhi, Serhi Hrabski, um the security specialist from the world bank group um, today's session uh, will focus on physical security requirements in Ukraine, protection of personnel, facilities and operations, uh, contingency planning in the situation of the armed uh, conflicts. So as you may recall, I think we had our first session with uh, Serhi in February 2022, just a couple of weeks literally before the full scale invasion. Uh, and we had some very, very practical and some very excellent recommendations that we we managed to use and then we had uh last um the last time i think it was last month we had uh the first session um with uh with Sidhi where we focused on a general overview of the current situ security situation and um the perspectives of doing business particularities of the crossing the border um, and traveling into the the country and today, I think it's going to be a very practical session, so we're very um, excited. And again, for those who didn't join last time, just to introduce Sir he is the security specialist at the World Bank Group covering Armenia, Belarus, Moldova, Poland, and Ukraine. Uh, he is the OSAC Ukraine co-chair for the uh, private uh, sector, co-founder of the All-Ukrainian NGO Union of Participants in Peacekeeping Operations. Uh, a retired colonel of the Ukrainian of the armed forces of Ukraine, a military expert, and the first citizen of Ukraine to be awarded the highest medal of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization for Special Merits, discovered during his service as part of NATO training mission in uh, Iraq. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm delighted to present the floor to um, Sirhi. Sirhi, over to you. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, you know, I have to confess, this session may be uh, the most challenging session uh, for me because of, you know, uh, each topic which we are going to discuss, I will, tr uh, I will, I will try to be as short as I could, but each topic which we are going to discuss uh, probably will need uh, additional sessions. But I, I do respect your time, and that is why. I would be glad to answer your question during the presentation. And uh, let's start. Let's start and uh, let me share my screen. Uh, where is it? Okay. Where is my presentation? Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, dear friends, this is uh, our agenda for today. Uh, as Andy mentioned, we will discuss some principles of and uh, some aspects of physical security. And uh, I would uh, like to offer you the following topics for discussion. Because if you know, physical security is very, very broad uh, definition and uh, we, have to be quite practical in our discussion for today and uh, having a short period of time, let's start from uh, the following topic. First of all, you know, uh, be for better understanding of what we are doing and why we are doing that, I just uh, would like to remind you uh, main personal security principles and main aspects. It's like a short, very short uh, message regarding the um, key three C principles of uh, personal security and seven mind principles. Uh, then then we, uh, I will uh, discuss with you, I will explain you maybe some specifics regarding the mind awareness is a quite important aspect of our, uh, of our security in Ukraine. As I mentioned during my previous sessions, the mind and unexploded devices uh, threat is the uh, biggest threat for us not only for people who are living in a so-called conflict zone or post-conflict zone. However, uh, it may be a threat for people living in so-called peaceful territories at the moment. 
uh, then then it's also quite important for us to understand how to react how to prepare uh, ourselves and our organization uh, to respond to airstrikes and possible shelling over there uh, very practical uh, very practical topics about the travels in ukraine how can we do that? What is uh, what are the main requirements for to make our travel more safe, uh, safer, and uh, more efficient over there? Also, we can't ignore personal preparedness, and I would like to share with you some practical tips which we found and uh, we uh, used during our latest mission. It's like a latest update over the light uh, last night when we uh, worked with our delegation, our uh, visiting mission. Contingency planning. Contingency planning, you know, it's a very, very broad concept uh, to discuss, and that is why I will try to be short, and uh, the, there will be a, a certain reminders what should we do and uh, what is a key topic for our uh, contingency planning, planning in this uh, unclear period of time. So, with that regard, let me start and Dear friends, uh, here, as usual, some sorts, uh, sources which we normally use during the preparation. I have to notify again that uh, we refer to the Sibylline reports uh, because it's quite important thing to, to, to study. Also, UN reports and analytical updates. Uh, I, I'm very thankful, grateful for your UN support providing us with the uh, a uh, list of available hotels. I will not put that list of the hotels here, but upon your requirements, I may provide you like a portions of those hot uh, of that list uh, in certain locations such as Kiev, Vinnytsia, Chernitsy, Kharkiv, Odessa, and other regions of Ukraine. Also, some uh, some analytical resources over there, and I can't ignore and would like to pay particular attention to uh, Emergency Service of Ukraine website where you could find quite important information regarding the minor warnings over there. And indeed alerts uh, in UA as a website where you could find uh, more, the most useful information regarding the airstrikes and air raids and air sirens. Why it's so important? Because of in your assessment, I'm talking to security professionals and uh, other security related personnel. In your assessment, you may require uh, certain information uh, regarding the particular situation in each in each location, in each oblast, in each uh, region of Ukraine. That is why that source may be quite important for you. Well, just briefly, dear friends, you know, uh, I'm not a professor, I'm not a teacher, I'm your colleague, and that is why I just need to remind you three uh, C, three pillows uh, on which we, uh, uh, on which the personal security base. And uh, let me start from the, just a reminder from that situational awareness map. Uh, dear friends, as you can see here, the left map provide us like a level of threat and the uh, level of risks uh, in Ukraine. It is a, a slide, it is a map from our previous presentation. And having that, and uh, I say again, I use UN uh, resources, uh, resources which I found quite useful. We now may divide Ukraine in three main zones. As you can see, see here, uh, so we divided the Ukraine in three main zones, such as a non-government control zone or battle zone, eastern zone, which is under control of Ukrainian armed forces, under control of Ukrainian government, but that zone needs a special uh, attention and special requirements to operate, to visit uh, uh, regions in that uh, zone. And Western and Central part of Ukraine, yes, there are some threats uh, and we have to keep it in mind. However, the situation in the Western and Central part of Ukraine is quite different. That is why please keep in mind that map. Indeed, after the, our presentation, I will provide you a PDF copy so you will be able just to refer to that map in your preparation and assessments. Uh, but let's start with the uh, main principles and uh, we call it 3C of personal security. Why it's so important? Because we know we are dealing with information. We are uh, operating in a situation of hybrid war at the moment. And uh, that hybrid war uh, deeply impact everybody. There is no even one single person uh, who is out of the influence of the hybrid war. And uh, there are some very 
basic tips for you. And uh, as we call it, three C uh, pillows of the personal security, such as common sense. Dear colleagues, please refer to common sense. You are adult enough just to filter all information coming to you through your filter of your personal experience, your intuition. And please uh, communicate with people. Communicate with people and uh, filter information, as I mentioned before, which is coming through uh, different sources. And keep calmness. Keep calmness. I know it looks quite obvious, but you know, it is a reality of our life. Uh, try to be balanced. Uh, try to be resilient. And uh, be calm. Also, just briefly, uh, there are actually seven principles of personal security. And uh, I beg your pardon, I will take maybe five minutes of your time just to remind it for you. Uh, they are quite basic and uh, uh, be uh, use an appropriate behavior and the response to the situation. It is an uh, obvious thing, and you should react properly to any challenge which we may face with during our life in Ukraine. Then uh, you have to understand the specific of culture and behavioral cues, and uh, just to be ready to prevent any hostile responses. As I mentioned before, you know. Uh, Ukrainian armed forces uh, will continue to liberate the zones uh, which are under occupation now. And unfortunately, as I told to my UN colleagues during my presentations, we have to be ready to respond in uh, not, friend, uh, to fr not friendly uh, behavior and reaction from, on, in liberated territories. Be aware and vigilant. This is a key principle of personal security. Be aware and vigilant. I'm not talking that you should be a paranoid, but uh, referring to principle number one, uh, the third principle require to be prepared for any differences in the situation, to be prepared to, uh, uh, to react to any changes in the situation. Using your uh, common sense, using communications, and using uh, your calmness skills. Then, I do recommend during your practical life to avoid so-called routine moments. Normally, when I uh, mention that principle to my UN students, I said, guys, it doesn't mean that you should avoid your, uh, your regulations, your rules in the organization, but try to make a uh, life of your offenders more difficult dealing in Ukraine also. Then be methodological, calm, and disciplined. It is interesting point uh, here, but I have to mention, uh, stay on that. Uh, what, what does it mean, methodological calm and discipline? You know, you may react to any uh, threat on the level which uh, where you have a training, enough training, uh, and be prepared for that. That is why be methodological calm and discipline means uh, train yourself be prepared for any reactions. And uh, those exercises may support not only you personally, but your organizations. And I will refer to it during uh, our lecture, mostly at the end, uh, when we will discuss uh, main aspects of contingency planning. Then uh, maintaining good communication, it's quite important. Good communication does not mean that you should all, uh, use only like a technical devices to communicate with the people. Make, as I call it, like a vertical and horizontal uh, le uh, levels of communication, which will allow you just to collect information and share information. Be responsible and uh, support people who are around you. Create a so-called uh, friendly environment around you. And uh, share all information which you may share. And adhere existing procedures. Dear friends, you know I am military. And I have to remind you that uh, our military slogan, that each letter in military manual, field manual, wrote by blood. And it is absolutely correct uh, referring to our current situation. We have to adhere our existing procedures. We have to adhere our protocols, security protocols uh, and safety protocols in our life. And uh, this is actually it. So those seven principles, I do hope you will follow those principles, but at least you will keep in mind that those principles are absolutely 
uh, universe and you can use it in your current life. This is it for personal security principles. And uh, if you have any questions, happy to respond. If not, let me proceed to more practical topics of our uh, current presentation. If no, I, I don't see any questions, so let me continue. Dear friends, uh, you probably, for those of you who participated in our pre uh, previous conversation, previous presentation, I show that map. I show that map where we could find uh, the more threatening locations uh, marked by orange color in different uh, layers. Also, as you can see, all Ukraine potentially is a place where we may face with a mine or unexploded device threat. So it may happen everywhere in each location. Mines or abandoned uh, ammunition or unexploded devices does not mean that uh, you may find it only in a zone of uh, battle uh, where battle crashes occurred or uh, in uh, municipalities where uh, which were liberated from, from the Russian uh, occupants. It may happen everywhere because we are under permanent threat of uh, the, uh, these uh, devices, if I may to say. And uh, I just made a latest update because of uh, this work continues permanently in Ukraine. As, as you can see here, as of today morning, uh, Ukrainian uh, emergency services, because of uh, I have to rely on official sources. Indeed, there are some additional information provided by uh, international non-government organizations responsible for the mining and uh, uh, cleaning of the territory. But let me refer to official sources. And uh, only during the last 24 hours, uh, emergency services checked 40 hectares of territory. And since the beginning of the, this year only, it's about 4,000 territory, uh, hectare, uh, hectares of territory. And uh, only over the last 24 hours, 486 unexploded devices, mines were deactivated. So you may imagine uh, how big the threat is. But you know, without understanding, what does it mean actually unexploded devices at mines? Uh, it will be quite uh, difficult to understand which, what kind of threat we are dealing now. And uh, just for your general uh, education, uh, I add here to this presentation, some slides uh, regarding the mines and the flow of the devices. And uh, it is for your information only. So here we can see uh, anti-tank mines. Uh, the first three uh, pictures on the top showed different types of anti-tank mines, which are broadly used by both sides of conflict, if I may to say. Uh, on the second layer, uh, you can see circumstances, uh, results actually uh, of explosion of minibus. I especially put here, not military equipment, I put here a civilian vehicle which had been explored when that vehicle pressed the fusion of the anti-tank mine. And as additional device in the middle of the uh, picture, you can see so-called side uh, anti-tank mine. So you may uh, find it, but do not approach to that device. It may look unusual, but if you don't put it, please do not approach, don't touch it, because the result may be like this one. Then, just to save our time, uh, uh, there are some examples of uh, anti-personnel mines. There are different and different types of anti-personnel mines, and uh, you can see even the size uh, on the left, uh, oh, excuse me, on my side, it's right one. Uh, on the right picture on the top, you will see a size of the anti-personnel mine. It will not kill you, but trust me, uh, that mine will, uh, inflict a heavy injuries to you. Uh, and also it may look like abandoned cans, uh, abandoned boxes, but I repeat again, if you didn't put it there, please do not touch it. And here, my special uh, part of the presentation and slide, I put here the most dangerous 
part of unexploded devices and mines, which may we, uh, we uh, may face with in Ukraine. There are three main types of uh, cluster munition. Technically, that cluster munition uh, program to self-explode after 72 hours, but reality is quite different. Those cluster munition uh, uh, mines are very difficult to be recognized. They are very dangerous, and uh, you may find it everywhere because of the options for delivery of those cluster munitions are different. Includes not only uh, aviation airplanes and helicopters, but also, uh, also multiple uh, launch rocket systems. Please, please be aware about such a threat and uh, follow those principles of the mine awareness. First of all, if you will find any suspicious device, just do not touch, as I said, and stop. Do not approach and report. You may report it to the official uh, services in Ukraine, 101, 102, and in parallel, I do recommend to report that uh, to your security professionals, if you have such a security professionals and uh, other responsible persons uh, in this regard. Uh, interesting warning. I do recommend, first of all, uh, before reporting, to guarantee a safe distance from that device at least 300 meters. 300 meters looks like a quite practical distance for safety, your own safety, because of, dear friends, remember, your own safety, your physical safety is the main priority, not only for you, but for your organization only. Also, excuse me. And uh, only after that, try to use uh, devices which may provide you additional safety. What I'm talking about, you know, uh, mobile phones are part of our life, usual part of our life. And uh, I'm quite <laughs> nervous when I don't have my uh, mobile phone with me. However, do not forget that uh, we may deal with so-called booby traps. And I can guarantee that some fusions will be not connected to the GSM network and the transmitting of signal of your phone may initiate an explosion. That is why ideally, ideally, it is good to use like uh, satellite communications, uh, communication equipment, uh, landline uh, phones or radios. Radios also, it's a good uh, stuff to do. And I'm glad to say, to announce that Ukraine are finally approved a radio communication network for UN staff. So UN as a organization will have the first all Ukraine uh, network, radio network in Ukraine, uh, in the country. Uh, that is why uh, I do recommend you, if you will have a, any kind of business with the UN organizations, uh, ask them about the possibility of using radio communication equipment. So uh, this is it about the mine awareness. I have to repeat, dear friends, uh, we may spend hours and hours discussing mine awareness topics and uh, different approaches, but I try to save time for questions and happy to answer it right now. As I can see, we have some questions, if I'm not mistaken. Is it correct, Andy? Andy, you're mute. Uh, sorry about that. So yeah, the question was, will we share the presentation? And so the answer is yes, we will share the presentation. Um, so that's the only question I see at the moment. Oh, marvelous, because I see five questions. Oh. Um, okay, great. Great, excellent. Let's proceed. Now we are changing, uh, we are approaching to another topic of our discussion, and it is about shelling missile attack shelters. Dear friends, you know, we use that definition my house, my fortress. Is it correct? Not always. Not always. And uh, excuse me, I didn't find like an English version because of uh, maybe lack of time, and I do apologize for that. However, this picture provides you quite good example of what is a threat. 
uh, of different types of uh, munition which may be used in our life in Ukraine. Shelling, I'm talking about artillery shelling, rocket shelling, and uh, uh, using of small arms and uh, 10 guns. So that threat. So, so that's, just going back, if I may, that there has been a question just so, but it, it's to the previous um, okay. slides. And uh, can you please also specify types of Soviet mine munitions initiated by GSM single, signal? Uh, you know, it is not about the Soviet type munition. Each munition may be initiated by GSM signal. And uh, it is like a fusion type. Munition, it's like an explosive material. And fusion type may be different. It may be like um, electro electrical fire type or uh, radio type, as we call it. And it may be initiated by the um, uh, GSM signal. Because of you know the GSM signal normally use like a very specified frequency, which is well known, and uh, it's very easy to adjust form as initiator of fu uh, of explosion uh, as a fusion. With that regard, there is no like uh, with that regard there is no like a specified type of munition. Is it Soviet or Western or South or Northern munition? But it is about the type of fusion mostly. So uh, normally we call it like a, two types of uh, explosive material devices may be used a uh, GSM signal. Roadside bombs, or in, in Ukrainian language, we call it fugas. It's like a multiple uh, explosive devices or uh, network, even network. And second one, it's a booby trap. Bobby trap, you may approach there, you may see something, you may make a call just to uh, inform someone, and that booby trap will initiate an explosion over there. Did I answer the question? Hope so. Oh, excuse me. So, again, Regarding the idea to stay at home during the uh, air uh, air sirens, air raid, is it a good option? I can't say yes, I can't say no. It depends on your common sense and reality of the situation. But the general or uh, I would say mathematic aspects of uh, that uh, risks show that the last or top floor in the building is very dangerous for any uh, kinds of air attack. Is it bomb attack? Is it missile attack? It doesn't matter. That is why it's up to your decision. You may stay in your home, you may stay in your apartment, but my recommendation would be to avoid it and get down to the shelter. And it is also interesting observation. You know, we are talking, and uh, I will mention it in, uh, during this presentation, we are talking about the underground loca location and when I ask people during my search in Kiev and other locations, asking, do you have shelter? The most of them say, yes, we, we do have shelter. But in fact, it is not a shelter. It is like an underground premises, which may be a trap for you. If those premises uh, do not comply with uh, general requirements to be a shelter. Also, also uh, regarding the shelling and uh, our small arm attacks, you can see that the uh, first uh, the floors from ground to the second one um, are very dangerous due to trajectory of uh, tank, uh, tank uh, projectiles uh, during, uh, due to grenade launcher using and uh, small arms using. That is why I also do not recommend you to stay during the direct attack the skirmishes in the certain locations in, the, in your building, if you are decided to stay or you will be trapped there. Uh, if it possible, just to uh, try to avoid it. If, if it possible, try to find a proper location. However, can we avoid it 100%? Definitely not. And that is why I would like to pay attention to the ne uh, next slide. And uh, it is a so-called two walls rule. Two walls rule, excuse me, uh, can you see my arrow?
Yeah, yes, yes, we can yeah, see. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, excuse me again, I use Ukrainian slide, but uh, two war uh, rule means that the, um, you may hide uh, beyond two concrete and uh, strong walls. Will it guarantee your safety? No, of course not. But it may minimize negative impact of uh, skirmishes, explosions, and uh, impacts. What does it mean? Uh, two walls, as you can see on the picture, the first wall will protect you uh, from uh, initial uh, impact, or we call it like a main impact. And second wall may protect you from our splinters or so uh, collateral damages over there. And uh, it's a, a practical observation for those of you I'm talking about mostly, uh, I'm talking about the local personnel. For those of you who live in uh, old fashioned buildings, you may see that the level of uh, floor in your, let's say, bathroom and toilet, a uh, little bit uh, higher than the level of floor in your uh, apartment. What does it mean? In 60s, 70s, and 80s years of the last century, according to Ukrainian and Soviet at the time rules, uh, those blocks, I'm talking about your bathroom and the toilet, were specially uh, dedicated to protection of people. So those blocks in the block buildings uh, created just to save lives of uh, people who stuck there. That is why if you don't have, I repeat, if you don't have any gas systems in your uh, bathroom, you may use it as a protection against the explosive materials, against the rockets and missiles. It will not guarantee 100% your safety. However, in worst case scenario, you may use it. Also, pay particular attention uh, to your doors. If you have doors with the glasses, if you have uh, doors, we not like a solid doors, uh, and you uh, you realize that the threat of impacts is high, I do recommend to remove those doors and light on the floor to avoid additional uh, impact to you as a so-called collateral uh, impacts over there. So will it guarantee your safety? I say again, no. But if you will be trapped in your location, in any location, please, please, please use that rule of two, uh, two walls to, uh, to protect, to save your, uh, yourself in, in that locations. So this is only it. What can I say about it? Because of dear friends, the best option to avoid such a risk to not to do not be present in that location however we can we can't guarantee that you will 100 percent avoid it and we have to be ready that is why search your location every time just train your brain train your mind how to hide yourself in any particular location search your environment say search your surrounding Try to save your life. This is it for here. Now, uh, sorry about some Christomatic uh, information regarding that, but uh, I hope it will be useful for you and for your organization to understand what is the difference between underground uh, premises, which many of us call shelters, and real shelters. As you can see here, and especially put the definition, the bomb shelter, it is not like a something underground. It is a room area usually underground and especially reinforced against the effects of bomb and uh, uh, may be used as a shelter, used as a shelter during the an air raid. Also, I would like to emphasize, it is a hermetic structure for long-term stay of people in case of emergency. That is why each underground location, and uh, uh, I do apologize colleagues from the hotel networks uh, showing us the shelters and the underground garages. It is not like exact, exactly a shelter as a definition because of there are following requirements for the shelter. First of all, shelter must have ventilation system. 
which is critically important uh, for that location. Also, shelter who, uh, should have a piped water supply and heating. Trust me, during our last few months, staying in an underground garage was not a good idea if you are not uh, wearing in, in proper way. Also, it must be some uh, means of communication. Indeed, ideally, I put here internet especially, but means of communication means that uh, you would be able at least to send a signal in case of emergency, if something will happen. Also, ideally, you should have some stock of food, water, and medicine. And in locations where we uh, live, it may be additional stockpiles for your animal, uh, pets. And I especially highlighted it. Shelter means that it is a premises with the two independent exits. All of those shelters may vary in uh, size, uh, in uh, specifics, but those main requirements, uh, main requirements must be in place, such as two independent exits, ventilation, food, means of communication. Hope I was quite clear. Anyway, you will have the presentation, and if you have any questions, happy to respond right now. No? Okay. Here, as I mentioned, it is an example showing, uh, actually, it is a Wikipedia. It's nothing, uh, nothing special. It is a Wikipedia showing what does it mean as shelter uh, for your organizations. As I said, it may vary. Uh, depending on the um, number of your personnel, location, availability of such uh, premises. But the main part of the shelter are the following. It's a premises for the people where people may sit or even sleep. It's a command and control post where you can manage the situation. I do recommend to have a medical uh, look, a medical post location over there to provide medical support for people who will need it. Indeed, as I mentioned before, ventilation uh, ventilation block must be in place. I say again, it is about like a general concept of the shelter, and uh, you may vary using different approaches uh, to create those shelters. But uh, this picture is a crestomatic one. Also, as I mentioned before, it may be some stockpile for the food and water over there. And if it will be necessary, uh, toilets, indeed. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it may be a location where if you have a generator, a stockpile of uh, fuel or it may be like a electrical uh, device, electronic device. Uh, as I said, two different uh, exits must be there. So, dear colleagues, it is a general concept. I say again, it may vary depending on your requirements. It may vary depending on the number of your personnel and your particular location. But in general, Please remember all of those principles and the main uh, part of the shelter in places. Any questions about that? Okay, practical tips, and I add that slide this night. Uh, why? Because of you know, most of us uh, travel in the in Ukraine. Most of us travel from out to Ukraine and uh, you may be in such a situation. So let's imagine what may happen and practically what may happen if you will get an air raid siren in the hotel, in particular. Uh, so, 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 sorry, we've got yes. some questions that have come out specific to the, um, the shelter. So um, first question is, uh, is there a difference in protection by principle carrying walls and intersections like perhorotki walls by two walls rule so uh, the, 
Yes, a uh, caring wall is um, actually is a good point. As a caring wall is a principle or a key uh, part of that protection. Caring wall is a uh, caring wall is a more solid walls, and I do recommend to use it as a, like a main layer of, or a layer of protection. We can guarantee that is why many of our offices uh, are out of our interest right now. We can't guarantee even the minimal level of protection because of uh, many of them do not have such a caring wall. But if you have it, if you will explore such an option, pay particular attention to that. Yeah. And then two other questions uh, about the wall. So in many modern buildings, the outside wall is all glass. Should a glass wall be considered a safe wall? Okay. And then uh, second question, I'll, I'll read it immediately. If, if there is no proper shelter, what about underground parking, e.g. in business center Eurasia and around there is no proper shelter? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. First of all, yes, uh, it is a, a very serious challenge for us because of, uh, I would say, almost all of our offices are full of glasses. And even putting of so-called anti-blast film will not solve that issue because of in case of uh, emergency, anti-blast uh, film will not support you. That is why, you know, there is, and it, it, it is a very interesting uh, uh, question. Why? Because of, you know, uh, it's just a point, and thank you for reminding me, uh, a point of our discussion with the relevant agencies. Because of, you know, there are many, many specific approaches with that regard. What should we do? having our offices and what kinds of additional physical security measures must be done to uh, mitigate risk of impact. For instance, uh, one of UN agency uh, creates a system or methodology, uh, I will, methodology, I, I would like to say, I would say uh, how to respond and how to prepare themselves. So they assume uh, that impact of uh, HA-22 missile will be in place. Why HA-22 missile? It's a, one of the biggest missile. It's about 1,000 kilos of explosive materials. And they assume that that impact will be in 50 meters far from the building. And they create all of their security measures, such as putting uh, bags with the sand, uh, increase level of protection of uh, facilities inside of the building and uh, reinforcing of the um, doors in the shelters and other things based of a result of explosive of such a missile. Uh, it's very discussable point, I would like to say, because if you know, it's uh, each agency, each organization may, may refer to their own uh, assessment, uh, their own acceptation. But it is critically important to understand uh, all of those aspects. In general, responding to the question, I say, I, I, I have to say again, no, we can't, not we can't use, we, we have to be very careful using our offices, like in a business center, because of from the very beginning, those business centers uh, were not uh, created as uh, shelters. Mm. Regarding underground garages, Indeed, we have to be, um, let's say, quite flexible, uh, understanding that the creation of like a solid protected uh, facility is quite difficult and uh, quite have a and has a quite big financial impact. And that is why I especially mentioned what must be done to have shelter even in underground garage. And visiting many and many locations, I found that the underground garage may be reinforced as a shelter. Well, uh, to avoid names of uh, those hotels, which I visited, many of them, I would like to say that some hotels did a great job to increase significantly level of protection, providing and following all of those main uh, requirements, which we have discussed already. So, and uh, as I said from the very beginning, dear friends, it's very difficult question, uh, di di a difficult topic for me because of each slide may be expanded to one hour presentation. Here, I try to provide like a general concept. What should you have? Uh, what should you have in no. each particular location? Okay. Responding to what, what one question on this very specific. So, 
there's a question if um, if we had to compare, yes. So if if a, if a shelter is not prepared accordingly, i.e., it's a parking, yes, with, without the heating, without water, uh, no no toilets. What do you recommend? Is it better to stay at home to follow the um, two wall rule or or to go to the underground um, uh, car park? It depends. It depends. Ideally, ideally, if we are talking about the multi tenant building, uh, I do recommend. I do recommend, and uh, moreover, I insist in, in case of Kiev, for instance, because we, we had it, to go to underground park, to be prepared for that. And that is why here, uh, as I said, it, it is a, a, this slide specially dedicated to our practical experience. Dear friends, check it before. If you have your underground park, or, uh, please check, check, and check in. There. Do they have a toilet? In underground park, who knows? <laughs> you know, it looks funny and uh, sounds funny, but it is our reality. Because of you know, something could happen in uh, in absolutely uh, unexpected time. Also, I do recommend before go there, prepare a specific go back, which, excuse me, shouldn't be a uh, very big. I will show you uh, so uh, that uh, other bags, but that go back must be like this one. I keep it always with me. Small one with the documents, with the pillow, with the blanket, battery pack and ID. And I do recommend just keep it every time with you. I, I, uh, I open it to, to prepare and I will show it late, uh, later, but everything is there, everything, trust me. Without, uh, well, I didn't put a blanket here, but if you are in the hotel, it is nothing wrong just, uh, to be prepared in, in advance for that. Grab your minimal belongings with you and be ready to sleep in that location. Also, it's a practical experience if you are dealing with a mission. Uh, please, please, please. As it mentioned in the bullet number two, ensures that all, all, all of your phone in a, on loud and no headphones. You know, sometimes it happened with me also when we need just to add some additional efforts to, I beg your pardon, to extract our clients from the hotel rooms and bring them to the underground uh, shelter. Also, I know it is a specific requirements for many of us, and it is part of our behavior during the mission. Please, in this case, do not double block your rooms to allow a security personnel or responsible personnel from the hotel to get uh, to your room and uh, alert you about the um, situation. You know, even in Kyiv, I can guarantee that the all of hotels provide like uh, information regarding the air strikes and the air alarms in their notification system in, the, in each particular rooms. That is why uh, you should have like a plan B and plan B may be, I put only one uh, option over here, alert in UA option, which may provide you additional uh, source of information regarding the situation uh, on the ground. Every time try to have like two options, like uh, sound and uh, information over there. This is a very uh, simple and practical uh, thing over there. And let me uh, get back to the first point over here, identify your nearest shelter. Is it car parking or metro station? It depends on you. Uh, practically, what do we have now? In my previous service in Iraq, the time between uh, alert and impact was about six, 10 seconds. I repeat, six, 10 seconds. In our real situation, referring to the common sense, the uh, time between impact and, uh, excuse me, between air alarm, uh, warning alarm, uh, warning system, and the uh, impact is about 10, 15 minutes. So having yourself in each particular location, you should realize what is the better option for you when you are walking to the, uh, on the street. Is it good uh, stuff to go to the metro station or it's a better just to find locations uh, near to your home or uh, in case of business center to get yourself uh, in an underground garage? 
in our case, I would say that both options are available and uh, good for us. It depends on your real preparedness, your uh, practical experience, and the distance between yourself and uh, matching locations over there. There is no like a clear answer to that, but uh, be vigilant and alerted, as I mentioned in the very beginning of our presentation. Well, next. Uh, sorry, Andy, if you don't have any questions uh, with the previous slide, I would like to turn to another topic of our discussion, and uh, that topic will cover travel options in Ukraine right yeah. now. Because if you know, we, mo we moved a lot, we uh, do our missions around all Ukraine, and uh, let's uh, concentrate on this part. As you can see, and it is a repeating of our previous map, uh, we divided Ukraine in three main parts now. So zone of non-government control, uh, zone of post-conflict or conflict, and so-called relatively calm zone. It doesn't mean that there is no even one single threat in that relatively calm zone. However, uh, the differentiation in the travel options uh, are in place. and. Let me start with the um, travel options and the uh, ground movements. Unfortunately, we are, dear friends, uh, we will not discuss any flight options because of flights now available only for military personnel. And uh, I'm doubt that someone use uh, uh, helicopters or airplanes during your stay in Ukraine, during, uh, in your missions in Ukraine. That is why let's be practical and concentrate uh, on a vehicle option. General requirements for the road movements within Ukraine right now. Uh, normally, normally, you know, <laughs> we use armored vehicles and uh, soft skin vehicles. And uh, for your understanding, please require from uh, responsible personnel or from your vendor, if you will use armored vehicles, that those vehicles must be fully supplied with uh, vital supplies fully equipped. It depends on your mission environment. However, it must be like a standard. Also, don't forget that uh, it is about the planning. You should have enough and sufficient number of vehicles for your travels. And those we, uh, uh, that number might, might cover and should cover an option of evacuation. So we can't guarantee that something will happen. And that is why we can't put everybody in a limited number of vehicles. Please leave some spare uh, space in each vehicle for evacuation. For instance, in uh, our general concept, we notify that in each vehicle must be driver and uh, no more than three passengers, ideally two passengers. But three passengers looks absolutely practical. And uh, indeed, we normally have like a two vehicles in our convoys. I'm talking about armored vehicles. Uh, another point about the personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment, uh, which is in our case, uh, ballistic uh, vest and a helmet, is uh, mandatory for everybody who will be part of that mission. And it is a very interesting point, and I always emphasize in that the dear friends, before travel, you should adjust the equipment to your body. You have to be absolutely confident that you have a proper level of protection using your personal protective equipment. I emphasize, dear friends, personal protective equipment. Because if you know, uh, sometimes your vendor or your uh, security personnel may say, okay, guys, there are, for instance, two pe uh, four pieces of uh, personal protective equipment in your car. But please, please and please, it is my practical uh, experience, please check that personal protective equipment. It must be adjusted to your head. It must be adjusted to your body. Otherwise, you will waste your time. I don't call and I don't uh, order you to put it on during all type of travel. However, in case of uh, increasing of the risk and threats, you have to be ready 
to put it on and uh, you will have trust me a very short time to do that we are talking about maybe 10 15 seconds only that is why train yourself that is why adjust your private personal equipment to your personal body also also uh, if you are talking about the first aid kit and we call it IFAC. We do recommend to have, first of all, IFAC, personal equipment, and more advanced uh, vehicle uh, equipment. Some, sometimes we call it emergency trauma bag, and sometimes we call it like advanced uh, individual uh, first aid kit, whatever. You should realize, ideally, everybody must be trained how to use a personal uh, medical kit or individual medical kit and ideally your drivers or other dedicated personnel must be uh, trained how to use it for instance i keep it every time with me i'm like a certified ifac user i always keep my personal uh, ifac kit with me i have it in my backpack, you, I you, have you, it. You say, well, so this is the uh, individual first thing. Individual, absolutely. It is an individual one. And uh, do not ignore uh, ignore an option to train yourself how to use it. I mean, just, just sitting very briefly, what, what, what's in it? Well, uh -huh. in it, first of all, you can see it's a tourniquet. Gloves, guys, it is mandatory. I call you, I beg you to keep it. Scissors, bandages, and uh, special blankets, and other stuff. If you would like, you know, I wouldn't like to waste our time because of our next session will be specially dedicated to training. And I especially invited two, uh, two companies uh, excuse me, one uh, British company and second one from uh, Ukraine, which will provide a detailed explanation. What is a, um, what does it mean IFAC in different, uh, you may find different and different types of those IFACs, but in general, you should have tourniquets, gloves, bandage, scissors to provide uh, the first aid option for everybody there. Also, depending on your personal skills and personal preparedness, you may have a different types of those uh, of that equipment, but you should have it. At least you should have it. Uh, but practical things uh, follow this, those recommendations. Individual uh, stuff and uh, your, let's say, team stuff. Also, also uh, for preparedness uh, for all, all of our, uh, our movements, I would like to pay your particular attention to the security communication systems and the GPS navigating system. Uh, ideally, ideally, in as a security communication system, there are two main types: uh, satellite phones and uh, radio communication. In uh, many cases, radio communication must be used for uh, com communication between vehicles in the convoy. However, it, it is a good tool to have it. And indeed, like an uh, additional point, uh, satellite phones. In this part of presentation, I would uh, like to show you my old fashioned stuff to Raya, but I do recommend uh, all of you to use and new, not new stuff, another type of stuff called Iridium phone. Trackers, yes, trackers is all also part of our mandatory equipment in each vehicle, and uh, we have it in each vehicle uh, also. Uh, some companies, some organizations have like a security operation room or security operation center, which also uh, controls all movements. 
And uh, my message is, uh, guys, do not uh, save, uh, do not try to save money, uh, do not use buying such an equipment. Trackers are also very important for us and may be used uh, for our travels. So, is it, Siri, what, 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 what do you use to track us for? Trackers, just to realize where you are. Tracker is some, uh, something similar to satellite phones. And uh, trackers uh, is an independent system. It not rely to the GSM system or other types of mobile connection. It rely on like a satellite communication. It's actually analog of satellite phone, but uh, tracker uh, transmits a signal where you are. And you may say, uh, send a signal where you are and uh, request an emergency evacuation or at least inform your responsible uh, organization or body such as security operation center or security room or operation room where you are what's going on with you also it's about like uh, it, it provide your uh, uh, not not you but security operation center and the other responsible center with where you are in each particular moment okay said so, just a very quick many sort of uh, new cars they have this sos button in, in the car is, is that what, what what how it works or yep yeah okay Excellent, thank you. Next one, trains. Dear colleagues, you know, it was uh, always very, uh, very discussable point. Uh, do we need uh, or uh, can we use trains? Yes, indeed. Indeed, we can use trains uh, inside of Ukraine, but you should realize and uh, common sense also says that the travel by train within the border of Ukraine is limited territory. Uh, government control territory only. And if you remember, I mentioned, uh, and uh, there is no actually general restriction for travels and using train in so-called Western and Central area. However, in case of the Eastern area, which is area where we have like a higher level of uh, armed conflicts uh, risk, travel by train permitted from, as you see here, Dnipro, Poltava, and Odessa to the west and central part of Ukraine only. Mm -hmm. So he, a question we had earlier, but I've waited until this moment. So, so they're asking, uh, what's your recommendation to travel to the border, the EU border? What, what, what do you recommend, uh, roads or, or train? Train. Train? You, train. Uh, uh, you know why? Because of it may save you time. And uh, dear friends, next slide, next slide. It is uh, my personal experience. Uh, there are some specialized option offered by the Ukrainian state railway. And why I'm talking about train? Because of, you know, uh, using car of cars, it's uh, quite expensive. Because of, frankly speaking, we did it during our previous mission. Uh, it is quite expensive because it, it, it's about the fuel consumption. It's about like a specific of travels. And uh, it also a very time consuming option. In case of train, you have at least a schedule. And you know that you will spend like a, from 12 to 14, up to 16 hours to get for, for, me, for instance, from Kiev to Chechnya. 14 hours if i'm not mistaken in from kiev to pshemysl it's about like a 12 hours and uh, to helm it's uh, also about 12 hours in general even less but uh, i would like to present you uh, my very specific uh, experience and uh, it is available uh, actually for everybody and uh, what do we had and uh, we will continue to do. The railway, uh, Ukrainian railway may provide uh, for the companies uh, very specific options or specialized option. Names like a specially booked uh, cars or even specially booked train. Uh, excuse me, there is a mistake in the third point. And um, uh, no, no, I didn't change it. So uh, you may request from the responsible uh, railway company uh, special cars which will bring you from abroad of Ukraine and get uh, and get, uh, get back from the Ukraine. There are two main options: scheduled train and specified train. 
excuse me for my mistake, I didn't change it. Uh, it's uh, like a technical one. In case number two, in option number two, you may find, uh, you may use like uh, cars, uh, specially booked for your team, for your mission only. And uh, normally- uh, This is are... tra tra train cars. Train cars, indeed. Uh, there are two cars, like a saloon car and slipping car. And if you will, the difference is the following. If you are using so-called scheduled uh, train, those cars may be added to the, uh, to the scheduled trains. And there are two options how to use it. Uh, from abroad of Ukraine, it, uh, it is possible from Helm and Pshemesl. You may order, you may book those cars. And as you can see here, please read it carefully. Reasonable capacity for saloon car. It's a uh, very fancy. And uh, I'm proud to say that our vice president uh, traveled into Ukraine and out of, of Ukraine using the saloon car, which President Biden used before. So it's uh, you. You may imagine top level of convenience and uh, luxury. I could say, with that regard, and uh, we use like a additional sleeping car for safety reason to prevent uh, unauthorized intrusion of uh, external people to your big bosses and uh, for your team also. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian railways provide such an option. An ideal one, and uh, please duplicate uh, duplicate the price. It is not about the ten thousand euro for two ways. It is actually twenty thousand euro. It is my mistake. Sorry about that. I didn't change it. Uh, ideally, so that that that's your own train. Own train. Own train. I emphasize your own train will depend on your requirements. Ideally, you should realize the uh, time of travel and uh, that option available only from Pshemis. Unfortunately, it's a, a, about specific of Ukrainian and Polish railways. Ideally, you may create and discuss with the responsible agency, I'm talking about the UN, uh, Ukrainian railways, uh, the schedule of your train. Uh, but it will take like uh, 10, 11 hours to, to bring you, to transport you from the Pshemysl to Kiev directly. And not only are international organizations such as World Bank and uh, foreign embassies or foreign delegation use it, it is available also for private companies. It depends on your budget. But frankly speaking, when I compare that uh, option with the armored vehicles, it looks the same, moreover, from the perspective of time consumption and uh, uh, convenience of travel, uh, those options are much preferable. More, uh, much more preferable to compare to compare with uh, cars. Moreover, armored vehicles, you may imagine. In our case, when we did our first mission to Ukraine, uh, it took us almost two days to bring a mission from Poland to Kiev. And you may imagine uh, at least 12 or 14 hours travels in armored vehicle is not a very convenient option for everybody. So even more, if, if we are talking about like regular trains, I would say that uh, now, despite of some difficulties, that train option uh, looks more preferable. Because if you know, you may rely on schedule. As soon as we don't have uh, any impacts to the critical infrastructure related to the transportation infrastructure, I would say that we can use it quite widely and broadly. So, uh, moreover, you may determine and you uh, you may understand the time consumption for that, mm -hmm. uh, for all of the travel. Because, of you know, in case of vehicle, we can't guarantee uh, any incidents on the roads. Road safety also part of our business. We can't guarantee any natural hazards. We can't guarantee human hazards such as like strikes, such as... Uh, uh, blocking of the roads or even some difficulties with the crossing uh, of the border. In case of train, we mostly avoid such as uh, risks. That is why I may say that indeed we may use uh, our vehicles. It depends on your budget. It depends on your ability. And we uh, we may also use a um, train option over there. Moreover, it's like a practical experience uh, what I face with during our, my practical mission in Ukraine. In certain time during the day, 
you may face with uh, huge queues coming in the railway station because the railway station in, in Kiev provides like a higher level of protection and searching. So you may imagine a crowd of people trying to get in the building and it, it may take like from half an hour to 40, even 50 minutes of waiting when all of those people will pass through. In case of separate trains, there is an option that you will arrive to the specialized uh, track, track number 14, and you will have an option just to easily and safely continue your movement by cars in, in Kiev. So if someone will interested, I may provide you more details about it, mm -hmm. but... So, so this is fascinating, just to clarify. So you're saying that the, the train, your own train will cost up like 20,000 euros, yes? 20,000 for euros. And then just to clarify, the the train car. So what, what what's the price for you saying two return is 6,500? Uh, 6,500? Uh, it, 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 it's about a uh, price uh, for scheduled train. Scheduled means that you will have only two cars added to the scheduled trains. It is uh, it must be duplicate. It's uh, almost 13,000 euros. I, as I said, it is my mistake, technical mistake. Okay. 13,000 and uh, 20,000. This is a di differentiation in the price. So, and scheduled train, also it's quite convenient now. You will uh, depart, for instance, from from Kiev at uh, six or ten o'clock, and you will arrive to Przemysl or to Helm, re respectively, at uh, six o'clock in the morning or eight uh, ten o'clock in the morning. And there is a good connection between Helm and Warsaw, if you want. It. But it is like a practical discussion. Over yeah. there. And just probably one final question on this that's come up, uh, and this is a question uh, regarding traveling. I mean, how, how secure traveling by trains now? Since at the beginning of the war, um, railways were tar targeted by Russian forces. Well, it, it is about statistic. As I said, we can't exclude that the Russians will try to attack uh, transportation infrastructure. However, uh, we did not see any significant impact of railway infrastructure right now. Moreover, during the tough period of our history, during the blackouts, uh, railway created uh, a quite effective system which uh, support uh, travelers during the blackout. Uh, big part of uh, Ukrainian railways uh, rely on electrical uh, supplies, uh, electrical locomotives. However, there is like a so-called diesel uh, locomotives columns which provide additional support. So with that regard, delay with the travel, I am referring to the blackouts, maybe from two to four hours only. Uh, in case of uh, option of separate train, we can ignore it because, you know, you are flexible and uh, the railway provide like uh, several options. In case of even impact, you may change direction of your travel and uh, reach to final destination in, in time or with a minimal delay. So it's quite secure. It's quite secure and I, I could say convenient. Uh, moreover, uh, if you check the statistical visit, the most of official delegations, including the President Biden, came to Ukraine using train. Do as Biden. Yeah, even Biden. I spoke uh, with the mic, he said train, train, and train. Ah. Next one. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have now not only one run back, but two individual kids. And uh, here, oh, excuse me, I will I will show you some quite heavy individual kit. It's quite exhaustive, but that kit, it is not like a Bible, dear friends. You should realize it is a proposal for you. Uh, that kit my, uh, may consist of iridium satellite phone, as I showed to you, uh, tracking devices. Sorry, it's uh, inside of that. IFAC uh, kit, you saw that. Signal panel, it's like a jacket which reflects and shows you. Smoke hood, it's interesting. 
not mandatory, I could say, we add it. It is uh, our decision to add it. That smoke could provide you uh, protection from the carbon monoxide in case of fire, in case of smoke. Who knows how situation will develop? At least we have it. Chemical lights, which will provide you independent lights for 24 hours. It's a red color and a portable power bank. It is individual kit provided by organization to mm -hmm. support our missions. It is only one kit. So can you just clarify number six? What are the chemical lights? Chemical lights is like a sticks. You'll break it and you will have like a 24 hours Okay, let me open it. Like this one, and lighter indeed. Are, are they freely available to be uh, purchased? Yeah, actually, we bought it. Uh, we bought it and we equipped uh, each of our uh, individual kit. We bought it in the United States. But like, like in, can you get it like on Rosetka or? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. It is possible to buy. Excuse me, this is a bad, a bad part of our presentation because ideally I should I could bring it and show it personally and uh, dispatch it to to check it personally. Also, portable power bank, it is quite important. As, as you can see, the capacity of that uh, bank is quite big. Mm -hmm. Just to mm -hmm. ensure that you will be able just to charge your computer. So here, there's a question on the uh, what do you call chemical lights in Ukrainian? <laughs> Oh, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we we can come back to that, but I mean. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting question. I can't remember yeah. because you know. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, no problem. Well, then uh, it's a uh, reminding. It's a uh, individual responsibility, dear friends. From my perspective, as a security personnel. Please, please, please be mindful about your personal preparation for the mission. Because of you know, uh, there is a huge challenge for us, for people who are responsible for your safety and security on mission. Because of you know, our armored vehicles are not like uh, comfortable vehicles for convenient travel. It is about uh, additional uh, protection. And we have a very limited uh, capacity in the trunk. That is why I beg you, I call you to minimize your luggage. Because of, can you imagine three persons sitting there? Each of them have like a, at least two packages, two backpacks at least, plus uh, car equipment and personal protective equipment. So you have to be mindful. And here, my message is about only maximum total weight, 15 kilos. You may put there whatever you want. I mentioned that slide several times. Please be mindful, be prepared for that. And you should realize and understand that it is uh, our common responsibility uh, to make our life uh, safer and easier. That is why up to you. Because of uh, one person asked me, okay, can I put like a 15 kilos of jewelry? I said, yes, even gold. It's up to you, but you, you have to realize what you are going to do with that. Uh, this is like a general observation, what must be there. And uh, based on your common sense, uh, you can see it's like uh, clothes, uh, wet wear gear, some knife, maybe roll mat, uh, food, water. Water is a critically important, not only for drinking, but uh, to wash your hands, to 
refresh yourself even more if you will appear in a location where somehow tear gas may be used you have to be you have to have water to protect you some medicine also some very personal medicines and the additional communication devices whatever you want here is an example but critical point is about the 15 kilos and minimal minimizing of the size of the liquid any questions about it yeah, well, I just want to thank the uh, the audience because uh, we, we've come up in, in Ukraine. It's called Chimichne uh, Jeralo Svitla. And uh, there are already two or three links on, on, on the chat on Rosetka. It's available to buy and uh, it's like 100 hryvnia, uh, which I thought is quite, quite reasonably priced. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, sorry, maybe I'm a little bit tired uh, after the mission. I, I can't remember. <laughs> Excuse me. But yes. You may buy everything now in Ukraine or uh, request it from abroad. So we uh, we use our standardized uh, system and we uh, we bought and we prepared those ki kits uh, centrally from our main office in DC. So we have standard equipment with only one precaution uh, about the charges. Chargers, it must be charges with the um, uh, plugins. Uh, which we normally use in Europe. Not United States plugins, but uh, European style. Well, next one. Now, guys, it is quite academical part of our uh, preparedness organization and preparedness. Uh, you know, there is no like one answer, what must be done? Because of, we are dealing with the different organizations. We are dealing with a different risk tolerance. But there are five main aspects of organizational preparedness. We should realize in each particular uh, moment, in each particular case, what is uh, what are threats and vulnerabilities and risks for you, for your organization, for your personnel. Because of even, uh, let me refer to the Ukrainian uh, to the Ukrainian experience with UN, we have 26 agencies, UN agencies with absolutely different approaches and risk tolerance acceptation in Ukraine. That is why you should realize and you should determine your personal or organizational threats and vulnerabilities. Also, it is about the emergency action and emergency operational plan. Emergency action plan mostly dedicated to save your people to save your uh, human resources. Operational plans, operations plans, more dedicated to how to manage, how to operate, how your organization will respond to the threat, to the risks. Also, it is critically important right now, right here, to uh, determine roles and responsibilities. For instance, for instance, you know, it's a, it is my personal experience, uh, we, kept in mind that we have seven vehicles and uh, we should have drivers. In fact, when the crisis occurred, drivers simply did not appear. So you have to be absolutely realistic dealing with the real resources and roles and responsibilities. You have to be ready to, uh, to react. Who will be a driver? Does your team have uh, enough drivers? How many people are familiar with the uh, uh, iPhone? How many people are familiar to use our um, individual or specific communication equipment, such as satellite phones or uh, even uh, trackers and radio communication? Because, you know, I'm sitting in the office. If I will try to make a call through the satellite phone here, sitting in the office, I will not reach my contact. It is impossible to make a call from inside of the building. It is also about the communication. What kinds of, uh, what types of communication, what means of communications are available for you? You should realize and understand. And training drills and exercises. We can't ignore it because, you know, we may, may, we may generate dozens and dozens of different types of plans. But all of those plans will not work until you will not test it and check it. You have to train your personnel. Even from the perspective of uh, bomb shelters, 
I could say that the ideal time to for your personnel to get to the shelter in three, maximum five minutes in total. But people must be ready for that. People must be prepared for that, to grab their belongings. As I mentioned, that individual evacuation kit in case of uh, in case of hotel and be ready to get to the shelter. So those five principles are key points of our organizational preparedness. You should understand it. Each of, the, of those principles, as I said, must be expanded to pure and full presentation, but we are limited in our time and uh, I have to pass through that. Then, it is about uh, steps in, in, in sequences about the, our preparation. First of all, personal preparedness. We can rely on our personnel line. And uh, we have to understand our measures, what must be done in case of preparation, during the preparation of process. Also, uh, then uh, we have to rely uh, on organizational understanding, plans, policies, procedures. As I mentioned before, as uh, based on the uh, experience and example of UN system, each agency has absolutely different approaches. Some agencies responsible for evacuation of all staff, some ag uh, agencies are not. So you have to understand your reality, your organizational requirements, your policies, plans, and procedures. You should realize the, and understand the threat and possible consequences. Uh, and indeed, you should mitigate all of those uh, threats and be prepared for that. And I have to repeat again, train and exercise, train and exercise, repeat it again and again. You, you know, please, <laughs> so, sorry to be a little bit cynic, do not trust people saying that we are experienced enough, we don't need to train our skills, which is not correct. Even in case of IFA. Even in case of IFAC, uh, you should uh, upgrade, uh, you should uh, repeat your knowledges, uh, you should be recertified every year. Because, of, you know, it's about like uh, not uh, everyday uh, protocols, procedures, and uh, emergency preparedness or organizational preparedness rely on permanent training and exercises over there. So those four steps, I, I know it is quite academical and we can discuss in each particular case what uh, we are going to do in each particular case, because if you know, we, if we are dealing with a um, factory, for instance, it is one approach. If we are dealing with a hotel situation, it's quite a different approach. But uh, those four steps may support you with a common understanding and a general understanding of all processes. Which, uh, which must be done during the preparation and the uh, conducting of such as uh, preparing. As I mentioned in the worst case scenario, if you have like one or two plans, it will not support you. Without contingency planning, you will not achieve a good result. And uh, if you will not train your staff, your bodies, your structure, you will not achieve a good result in your processes of personal preparedness and evacuation. Here, it's also about um, uh, general tips or general recommendations regarding the training and exercising. You will have it in the, in the presentation after the end of this meeting and uh, just refer to that. You may filter, you may pass it through your mind, through your organization just thinking uh, effectively and carefully about each of those blocks. But my idea here to provide you to test a point that, uh, dear colleagues, our uh, preparedness process is not like a um, one-step one business. It is like a permanent cycle of preparedness training and uh, execution of those preparedness uh, exercises. This is actually it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I finish. Any questions, additional questions? Excellent. Thank you, Serhi. That was uh, extremely uh, uh, well prepared and uh, very informative and very helpful. Um, I've, we've got a few questions here. So regarding um, travel, 
Um, okay, about uh, cars and trains. Um, what the question? Is, what, what do you think about traveling through Moldova through by by, by vehicle? Um, it uh, well, uh, with only one exception. It's uh, also quite a time consumption. Uh, you should avoid Transnistria. Yes, yes. It, it is a main message. Beyond that, there is no limits for visiting Moldova using cars. Yeah. I, I, I've done it myself, and um, I think I got from Kiev to the border in four hours through uh, sort of Vinnytsia region, and um, then it's three hours from like the border to uh, Kishinev. So, yeah. Um, okay. And then um, we have a question. Why, uh, why why doesn't Thuraya operate in the region? Satellites. Thuraya, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I raised the issue several times. Uh, I can't sense that Thuraya does not operate few, uh, fully in the our regions, but Thuraya as a system has a concentration of satellites uh, along the, let's say, equator. On the south direction. So you should realize where is your south direction. Moreover, you should have enough open space to get it. For instance, in my office here in Kiev, I may use to rise staying on my terrace. But if we are dealing with like a normal situation, uh, if you are in a city, it's quite difficult to reach a signal from to, uh, from to rise satellite in our location. Uh, it also it depends like uh, on angle from equator zone from the tropic zone and high on the top on the top on the north it's uh, angle of uh, signal is different and uh, it is difficult and quite uh, it is difficult to reach the signal from Turaya. in case of iridium situation much better because of iridium has uh, much broader network of satellites and you may reach a signal from say, Iridium satellite in uh, three, five minutes. Be patient about that. But to rise, it is a good stuff, but it depends on uh, depending on territory. For, for instance, in my case, uh, we fully exclude to rise from Belarus because of despite of my desperate attempts to reach signal from different location of means uh, by to rise, I failed. Uh, also, also, uh, I used to ride in Mariupol. I used to ride uh, in other location in the eastern conflict area. But our reality right now says that to ride is not reliable stuff. Generally, I say again, I don't say that uh, to ride is uh, garbage totally. But to ride has a very, very, and very limited capability to connect you with uh, your counterparts with your client. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think the question about the missiles that, that can't, that there's no air defense system, I think we covered last time the Kinjals and, um, and others. Yeah, uh, I, may, I may add that, uh, you know, efficiency of the anti-aircraft system, uh, about the 60-70% recognizes a good one. But 60-70% means that uh, from 10 missiles, 3 missiles will penetrate through the system. It may impact it. It depends also on type of missiles. And also, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, we can compare the anti-aircraft uh, system with the antivirus system. Antivirus system in each computer recognize computers, or excuse me, viruses, uh, which are well known for that antivirus system. But antivirus system uh, does not able to react on any threats and viruses which are not in the memory of that uh, antivirus system. The same story with uh, different types of missiles. Moreover, I could say uh, at the beginning of our history, when Russians started to use drones, effectiveness of anti-aircraft systems uh, uh, with drones was quite, uh, quite minor. After that, after experiencing, after preparing of the system, uh, the level of effectiveness increased significantly, but not guarantee 100% of results. Yeah. And then um, there's a comment. You mentioned sort of the uh, hotel shelters. Um, will, um, 
will we be able to provide a list of the hotels that have the appropriate um, sort of shelters? Well, you know, it's a very discussable point, frankly speaking. Uh, let's call, uh, let's say, uh, I checked in the center of Kiev three hotels. Let's call them Hotel H, Hotel I, and Hotel F. All of them have uh, underground garages. All of them cover uh, main requirements. But it depends on convenience, because if you know, in one shelter, we did not have a toilet. In another shelter, is, uh, there was, for instance, oh, uh, there were no like beds to lie down uh, and uh, don't laugh because it's quite important. Some uh, Somehow and sometimes we spend four hours sitting in the shelter during the nighttime. So uh, that is why personally, I may share this at least, but uh, you know, it's a, about sensitive point about, you know, maybe your personal requirements. You may call me and uh, I will tell you, but frankly speaking, I would uh, avoid sharing of that list sure. in total. Yeah, that makes also, sense. Um, uh, also, you know, in one of the hotel, which we find quite convenient, uh, there is even a conference room. A huge conference room, it's, it's quite uh, usable, but you know, it is about commercial. So I could say that in, a, in the center of Kiev, all hotels have an appropriate level of preparation uh, as an underground shelter. They are not ideal, but we can use it. Yes, yes, and we, we have done, so um, excellent. So yes, yeah, so, I mean, there, there's questions regarding the presentation. So we, we will share the presentation um, afterwards with the, uh, uh, the the members and please feel free to share it with your uh, employees. If you want to translate it to Ukraine, please do. And we'll, we'll be more than happy to um, to share that and that will come afterwards. So uh, dear friends and dear colleagues, I think that's pretty much it with the questions. So. You know, again, uh, said he, on, on behalf of the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine, we're very grateful to you uh, for your professionalism, for your passion, and uh, for your uh, always openness and willingness to, to help. So this is two out of three. We have another third um, session coming up. I think we're going to have the dates of that very, very soon. Um, so, yeah, so said he, over to you for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, I'm always happy to support you and feel free to call me. Uh, probably I will need to add my phone number here in the presentation. And uh, I invite you to the third presentation, which will, if we agreed, uh, on 6th of April. And uh, as you saw, I gently push you, frankly speaking, uh, to an idea that the training options uh, must be done and training of our personnel our personal training is a quite important part of our life and our uh, doing business here in ukraine and uh, with that regard uh, i glad to inform that on the next presentation i will be not a presenter as a general presenter but i will hand over uh, those responsibilities to two main companies one of them will be british company acadian I beg your pardon, I didn't find American company uh, which provides such a level of trainings, different aspects of training. And for balancing, uh, there will be another company, SAR company or paramedic company from Odessa, which is uh, well known inside of uh, UN family. And that company is certified uh, to conduct uh, security related trainings and uh, first aid trainings. That is why it's uh, to your judgment. It will be to your judgment to have such kind of uh, presenters. And I call you to participate actively. At least you will get some interesting information about the responsibilities, about the uh, spectrum of training, which they are able to conduct in Kyiv, in Odessa, in other location, depending on your requirement. And see you on 6th of April, if I'm not mistaken, at 11 o'clock also. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarahi. Thanks for everything. Stay safe. God bless. And uh, together to victory. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.